the fiscal 2024 budget has arrived with much fanfare. There's been a great deal of interest in the budget um, just released much more than I have seen in the last few years. And there's been a lot of commentary on, on the budget, um, economists, political scientists, politicians, businessmen, um, and even the general public. People are going through the budget line by line, uh, looking at each line item and agreeing or not agreeing. There's been a general sort of sense of disappointment uh, that the budget is not transformational in nature. In other words, it does not lead to a fundamental transformation of the economy. But I would argue that it was never intended to be a transformational budget. The program was, or the budget was designed with two objectives. One, fulfillment of the IMF conditions to complete the ninth review that's been up in the air since February, and two, to help the ruling government in the upcoming elections with some mild populist um, measures, uh, salary and pension increases for government employees, for example. Although I, I really feel that from a populist standpoint, the growth target of 3.5% built into the budget is optimistic, but it's still not adequate, but it's optimistic. So in that sense, to view, I view the budget as much more of a stopgap or a holding operation. Uh, it's A, designed to get the fund on board, and B, to win the next election. I can't really speak to the second objective, that is winning the election, obviously, uh, because I have no expertise on the matter. But I will stick to my lane and say something about the IMF issue. So the question is, will the IMF agree with the budget and complete the ninth review? There are three remaining conditions uh, for the completion of that review. That is the budget, which we know. Uh, but the second is, is uh, freely operating Forex market. And finally, there's the question of adequate external financing amounting to, to something like $6 billion. Now, even if the budget is acceptable to the IMF, the other two conditions have to be met. And here, uh, the government will have to come forth with um, some ideas on how that uh, those two conditions can be met. So, in particular, can one really argue that the Forex market is, is free and freely operating? I'm not sure. In any event, a supplementary budget will be needed after the elections to begin negotiations with the IMF on a new program. Now, this could be a transformational budget that would, A, expand the tax base, not simply raising taxes on, on existing taxpayers, B, rationalize expenditures, particularly subsidies, um, and C, reduce government borrowing, i.e. controlling the fiscal deficit, which even now is close to 7% uh, of GDP. Um, and unfortunately, however, the, with the government borrowing comes the rise in government debt, and half the, the more than half of the revenues of the government go to debt servicing. So by itself, this will not be enough to transform the, the Pakistan economy, even if the government does all these things in the next budget. Macroeconomic stability, that is defined as low inflation, a financeable current account deficit, adequate foreign exchange reserves, uh, are only a necessary condition for long-term economic growth and development. You need, for Pakistan, you need somewhere in the region of six to seven percent of growth just to absorb the new entrants into the labor force. So what are these sufficient conditions and will they be met? Well, sufficient conditions really are increasing 
private um, investment, both foreign and domestic, uh, privatization of state-owned enterprises to allow the private sector to move in there, human capital development, which we've heard a lot about, the education system in Pakistan, technological progress. There's a whole long list. These are just the main ones. Other countries, in fact, have done these and have done so. Even in the neighborhood, they've done so. The question that I have is, why can't Pakistan? Well, this is a question for current and future political leaders to answer and address.